Well, yeah, thanks first of all for the invitation to speak here. H here you see a first example of a periodic foam. So what you might not see in the center of these cells, you'll find atoms. And so this is a Voronoi diagram of um, those atom positions. And um, well, what you can guess from the picture is that it will be periodic, so you can extend it to a three space. And uh, this is what we will start out. And at a later point, we will meet on our way various manifolds. Um, so yeah, the beginning will be the phones. Then come simplicial manifolds with small valence. Recognition of manifolds will be a, a matter. And at the end, uh, we will see some of the combinatorics of three manifolds. So the foams. Well, let's look at methane hydrate, um, which has uh, CH4 as a gas molecule, uh, surrounded by a cage of uh, frozen water molecules. And well, the nice thing about it is you can burn it. So uh, this is a, m maybe you know the substance, but it really is great. So you, you get your hands frozen, burned, and watered at the same time. <laughs> so. <laughs> well, it, it's like ice. So it, um, it's a crystal, it, okay. sim simply like snow. The, the whole, whole thing is a solid, and uh, in, in fact, it, it's interesting. Um, this is um, a, a potential future source of energy since you find a lot of this um, material off the shelves of, uh, um, well, what do you call it? Um, some, somewhere in the ocean, on the, um, uh, on the ocean ground. Uh, but the problem is, of course, how to extract it from there. Um, well, I I if there's a way to get it out without uh, pumping more energy into it, to, then, well, perhaps it would be a good source of energy. Um, right, but it it's really like these are the water molecules, and this is the water crystal, and in the middle of it, uh, there is the uh, methane hydrate. And what, of course, happens if you uh, in light it, um, it, it starts melting and uh, the methane hydrate is, uh, is a gas and it burns and that uh, forces the further melting process. For this reason, the whole thing is called sometimes flammable ice or crystalline gas. Hmm? Is that actually a dodecahedron cage? That's actually a dodecahedron cage. It's In the picture previously, yeah. This is, uh, we come to that picture again. Um, here it is. So, uh, so what is going on here? Um, well, you can also have some metal structures. Uh, it's not only these cloth rates, uh, but what uh, the con constituting atoms or molecules that appear here, they are similar but slightly different in size. And um, this uh, opens up the possibility that uh, the Voronite diagram for these atoms or molecules f forms a foam. That means that's a collection of uh, constantine, uh, constant mean curvi curvature surfaces meeting according to Plateau's rules. So you have three cells around an edge and at a vertex four cells are meeting. This is quite nice since then you can form the dual and the dual uh, the uh, Delaunay triangulation of the positions of the atoms uh, is built of nearly regular uh, tetrahedra. And for this reason, this uh, thing is sometimes called tetrahedrally closed packed structures, or TCP structures for short. And it's periodic, so yeah, you can extend it. Now comes a surprising observation that uh, chemists and material scientists uh, found uh, by experiments, all periodic forms that are found in nature are built of only four cells. So yeah, this is the dodecahedron. Um, the second one is a, almost a dodecahedron, but you have two six gons. 
So there's one here in the front and one in the back. And here we have three six guns on the equator. So here's one, here's the second, the third is on the back. And here we have four six guns uh, in a tetrahedral position. And all the other faces are, are uh, pent uh, pentagons. Why no others? So I don't have an answer. Other people also don't. Um, so uh, maybe there is um, some variation principle that would allow to settle this question. But are these all possible polyhedral five pentagons and hexagons so that no two hexagons join each other? Um, no. I think you can build others. Sucker ball, yeah. Oh. Or, well, what, what you uh, could do is. Uh, the is ball, the yeah. Yeah. Yeah, right. oh, that's right. yeah. yeah, that's right. Yep, yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, but, well, in the beginning, it could be other cells, but this, these are the, the four that we see. There's something more interesting going on. So this is um, a list of, of different materials. Um, and they, I don't understand these names, where they came from. Uh, but um, these are some short names for, for these substances. And here uh, is um, uh, the number of atoms in a domain. And here is uh, how many uh, of the different cells, uh, the proportions that you see here uh, in such a subst substance. If you look at this table for a long enough time, then you recognize a nice thing. So there seem to be three important examples um, from which you can form linear combinations or convex combinations to reach all the others. Of course, y you cannot do that uh, in, in your experiment uh, since, uh, well, m melting like methane hydrate with uh, metal won't fit. But you, you can do that combinatorially. So, um, well, if you look at this vector, then you can now figure out how many, uh, what, what kind of combination you need. So you need one, one times z, uh, this is this vector, and then you add to it two times a15, this is this one, and this way you get all the other vectors. And what this is, you can continue uh, this table with all the substances that have been found and all satisfy this pattern. So these are these three basic substances. So this is A15, and this is sort of a rod packing. Or, uh, so here uh, we have a rod of uh, those um, uh, dodecahedra plus uh, six uh, two six guns, so there's a six gun here, six gun there, six gun here, and then you can continue this rod. Um, there's another rod going into this direction, and there's one rod uh, going this direction, and in between you have dodecahedra that fill the space. Those are not regular uh, dodecahedra, they are combinatorial dodecahedra. And these are the other substances. Right, so let's plot um, the convex combinations of, of these. Um, so here in the corners, uh, we start with the four uh, possible cells that we have in our game. And then we form co uh, convex combinations. So this is a, uh, I've forgotten the numbers, one third uh, made up of D12 and two thirds made up uh, D16. And uh, then there are these three substances that form a triangle and all the periodic forms that we find in nature, uh, they give us a point on this triangle. Well, of course, you could ask what happens if we start with these four cells and glue them together to form, say, a manifold. Then what we immediately know is if we only take uh, dodecahedra, then resulting manifolds will be quotients of uh, the... 120 cells. But there are other manifolds as well. Um, John Sullivan found that if you have a surface uh, times uh, S1, then you can build such a structure uh, 
decomposing this surface, uh, such a, a triangulated three manifold in, into uh, um, uh, cell types like this. And uh, what we found also is that, for example, the Poincaré homology three sphere has such a decomposition. Oh, no, it's not the surface, it's somewhere in the, in the interior, right? But if you now look at this, and if you perhaps have seen the uh, decomposition of three manifolds, you might wonder, well, here the quotients of the 120 cell are all spherical. They are, of course, quotients of, of the three sphere, uh, so they are of this geometry. Um, the uh, periodic phones, uh, because they are periodic, uh, they more or less are three tori, and therefore they are flat. And now we also have examples of, of these different uh, geometries here. So one might wonder whether we, can all, whether we can get all of these geometries. So why not only these ones that we already know of? And, um, well, to state this problem, uh, Kastner and Sullivan, um, they studied these TCP triangulations, which are, well, triangulations whose combinatorial duals uh, have cells of, of these four types. And, um, well, these are triangula triangulations that each edge has valence five or six, and no triangle that has two edges of valence six. This is precisely the statement, you have not two neighbor ring six gons. Right, so does every closed orientable three manifold has a TCP triangulation? Well, if you hear this for the first time, this might sound very demanding, um, but here's perhaps some evidence. There's a theorem by Cooper and Thurston, every closed orientable three manifold has a triangulation in which every edge has degree at most 10. Well, we are looking for five and six. So well, what they did is, um, well, M you can get as a covering um, of S3 branched over Bormian rings, then paving by cubes, and in the end you can uh, make it to a triangulation, and in this triangulation there are only five types of vertices, and then you can count the valences. And then you figure out that uh, you have at most uh, 10 tetrahedra sitting around an edge. This can be dramatically imp improved, so one can even say every closed orientable three manifold has a triangulation in which every edge has degree four, five, and six. So this is now pretty close to what we are looking for. Right, so this is what we know, four, five, and six. This is what we would like to have. So let's play around with it. What about three, four, five? just for the beginning. So we, we look at, say, simplicial manifolds with small valence. And before we go to three manifolds, let me first have a look. Well, this is uh, the question that John Sullivan once asked me. So well, consider three, uh, triangulated three manifolds with every edge valence at most five. So are there only a finite number of such triangulations and are they all spherical? And well, perhaps you ask whether I have such a list. I didn't at that time, um, but it's, uh, well, I, I will tell you. So, but before looking at three manifolds, let's look at two manifolds. That's a little bit simpler, two manifolds. So two manifolds, we want to have triangulated two manifolds. And uh, well, with F, that's the F vector. Uh, this is the uh, number of vertices, the number of edges, the number of triangles. What we, of course, know is the Euler characteristic, uh, the alternating sum here, and we have double counting. So every edge in a uh, triangulated uh, surface is contained in two triangles. Every triangle has uh, three edges. Um, and by, by these two relations, we immediately can write the F vector or phase vector in this way. Uh, then we can plug in this additional um, uh, thing that we want to have, that the vertex degree is at most five. This immediately gives us that uh, the number of vertices is smaller or equal to 
six times the Euler characteristic of the surface. Sounds good. Since? Well, if M is hyperbolic, that would mean um, you have the Euler characteristic negative. Well, we don't want to have a negative number of vertices. Um, also, uh, flat is not good. And um, if M is spherical, then this immediately gives a bound uh, of, uh, for, for the number of vertices to be small or equal to 12. This seems to be an easy problem. So, but how can we get these examples explicitly? Well, if you have a little time, you might try this during this talk. Uh, maybe you need a bit more time. So, well, in theory, of course, you can do that by hand. Um, but I want to show you a simple procedure um, by computer enumeration, since later on, I, well, we used this program then to, to settle the three-dimensional case. So, well, this is written up very naively. If we want to have a triangulation, we need to, to, to have at least one triangle. This is our starting triangle. <laughs> and, um, well, this is the lexicographically smallest edge here. And this edge has to be in a second triangle. So, we add a second triangle. This brought in a new vertex. Then this, again, is the lexicographically smallest edge. We, have, we need to have this one in a second triangle. And now there are two options. Well, either we sp spend a new vertex, or we might close this here. And then we continue. Well, from a computational point of view, this procedure is, uh, well, dramatically bad. So the only thing that saves it is this um, requirement that uh, the degree of a vertex is at most five. Well, since you, well, what you do is you, you pick the edges um, lexicographically. So say here, in this case, the next edge to be picked is this one. And this would perhaps uh, add another vertex, but th then it's over. Um, so locally, we cannot have at most five vertices. And, well, this way we continue. So the result is there are 12 examples, 11 two spheres with this property, and the blue one is uh, RP2 with six vertices. And that's it, in a two-dimensional case. And the nice thing is these vertex figures, they have to appear as the vertex links in the three manifolds that we are searching since this is precisely then the condition that uh, such an edge has at most five tetrahedra around, sitting around. Okay, so let's move on to three manifolds. Let's do the same um, combinatorics. So that's the F vector. Well, now we have also a number of tetrahedra we have the Euler characteristic, which is zero for a three manifold. This is double counting again. This leads uh, to the F vector. Now we have two variables, the number of vertices and the number of edges. Come, in next step, the degree condition comes in. That leads to a restriction on the number of edges. Well, here we have, an ad in addition, a restriction that the number of edges can never exceed n choose 2. We never, for a triangulation, can have more than uh, a complete connected graph. So what about a lower bound? Here's a lower bound. Um, that's from a paper from Walkup from 70. So now we have a, some, some sort of corridor for the number of edges between 4n minus 10 plus some three manifold invariant gamma and uh, smaller or equal to 6n. And Wokap even was able to compute this um, invariant for four examples of three manifolds. Later in the talk, I will tell you more about this invariant. So uh, recently, we were able to compute the invariant for 20 more examples and we're able to show that um, gamma of m is larger or equal to 21 otherwise. But does that help us? 
Well, we are now searching for triangulations of three manifolds in this corridor with a property that around every edge we have at most five tetrahedra. I haven't, uh, I haven't told you how it is defined, but it is a topological invariant. Okay. A, a combinatorially defined topological invariant that assumes that every three manifold can be triangulated. And so more or less it's a nu some numerical invariant you can associate with every three manifold. Yeah, well, stop me at any time if you have questions, please do ask. Right, so now we have this corridor and we let our program loose. <laughs> so, well, in theory, the program can, well, maybe it's, it could still be running, but it stopped after four and a half days. <laughs> after four and a half days, we got a result. There are only finitely many examples. <laughs> <laughs> the, well, a priori, there wasn't a restriction on that. So, in fact, there are exactly 4,787 triangulated three manifolds that have edge valence at most five. And most of them are spheres, and these are quotients of spheres. Uh, in particular, all the examples that we found are spherical. So, that an answered that um, question in the beginning. Oh, the, the last one, that's a, it's called cube space, and uh, th that's a quotient by the Quaternion group. Um, so you get this with 15 vertices um, as a quotient. Um, well, surprisingly, in the same, same year, uh, where Mat Vladimir Vat Matviev and Shevchivchin were able to show that uh, every triangulated three manifold with edge valences at most five is spherical and has at most 600 tetrahedra. Uh, so that would have given us an upper bound with 600 tetrahedra for our program, but of course no guarantee that it would have stopped by now. Um, but this is what they can say. What we can say is this is... They did that without a computer. Oh no, without a computer. So uh, this... Uh, involved uh, curvature and differential geometry. So, but this is the list that we found. So, well, this is the number of vertices. With five vertices, there's exactly one example, which this is the boundary of a simplex. With 120 vertices and 600 tetrahedra, there's exactly one example, the 600 cell. And in between, you have more examples. So what we saw is that, well, if you uh, require small valence, then you get positive curvature. We could answer this question. We still cannot answer what happens here, or uh, at least we found out a little bit more that comes in one of the next slides. But if we reduce the valence condition further, then in every dimension d larger or equal to 4, here, the valence restriction is, of, uh, is on co-dimension two phases. So in if we have a surface, we were looking at uh, the valence of a vertex. In dimension three, where we're looking at the valence of an edge, and so on. Um, well, if we require this restriction, then we can say the number of vertices is bounded below and above um, by um, this expression on the di dimension, and we even can say what, what the examples are. They are all joint products of boundaries of simplices. So this is a complete, con a complete picture of what we have here. Now, just last month, um, Igor Pak asked the reverse question. So what does happen if we are looking for three spheres with all edge valences, at least five? So have they at least 600 tetrahedra. Well, funny enough, um, this question was answered on the same day. And um, there, well, say two answers to it. Uh, it's true for spheres, and it's wrong for homology spheres. 
And this is somewhat surprising, or well, not, perhaps not surprising, but um, very often uh, you cannot uh, distinguish between spheres and homology spheres. Uh, so most of the time, you, well, you're working with uh, Betty numbers or homology and they won't detect any difference. But here there's some topological difference. I will show you the example how that works. But um, this is an example that we found um, some time ago. That's a 24 vertex triangulation of the Poincaré homology three sphere. So 24 vertices, 130 tetrahedra. And this one is invariant um, under the um, group of rotations of the icosahedron and the dodecahedron. And the construction is rather nice and simple. So you start out with the dodecahedron, you place an icosahedron in the center. So to triangulate the icosahedron, you place an, a vertex in the middle of uh, the icosahedron. You have the blue um, edges here, which gives you a triangulation of the icosahedron. Then in between the icosahedron and the dodecahedron, uh, you have the green lines that allow you to triangulate the space in between. And then in order to get the Poincaré homology three sphere, you have to identify opposite pentagons by a coherent twist of p fifth. That's what we did. So that works out with 24 vertices. Now you can modify this triangulation and um, that yield, the modification yields an 18 vertex TCP triangulation so that the duals are these two cells or these two cell types. And um, this uh, resulting triangulation has 18 vertices and 100 tetrahedra. And the construction is simple. So we want to get rid of the vertices that are on the faces here. And because we had a, an identification, we had, uh, well, the dodecahedron has uh, 12 faces and two opposite are identified. Uh, so if we remove these vertices, that chops off six vertices and we are down from 24 to 18. And well, to, for this part, more or less what we um, take out is this part and we take out this part and re-glue in an edge that goes from here to here and um, then have five tetrahedra sitting around that. And we do that for all or opposite pairs. And this gives this TCP construction. And well, how do these cells occur? For all the cells here in the center, uh, so these are the vertex figures, um, around the center vertex and uh, all the icosahedron vertices, we still have a dodecahedron, but for the five um, vertices that are here on the boundary, we have these other cells. Okay, so that has answered that question. Recognition of manifolds. Well, why is this an issue? I showed you this table. This comes out from a computer enumeration but how can you tell that such an example that you found by gluing together tetrahedra is a three sphere? Well, basically, it, this was the result. So either a three sphere or these other types. So basically, this is perhaps doable for the three sphere, but it's somehow hopeless. So there are algorithms for recognizing the three sphere. Uh, but some of the running times are like, say, 2 to the 20, uh, 2 to the 40,000 n squared. You would never like to implement such a thing. So theory says, well, you can recognize a three sphere, but well, we want to do that in practice. And here's a simple heuristics on recognizing the three sphere. It's based on simulated annealing with bistellar flips. And so what you do is, here are bistellar flips. So if you have a triangle in a triangulation, you can subdivide it by introducing a vertex, or you can flip an edge. In dimension three, you can still add a, a vertex here in the center, or instead of having two tetrahedra, you can introduce an edge with three tetrahedra sitting around. And then you can let the computer do this for you. And of course, the the goal is you start with a, say, big triangulation. And of course, whenever you can get rid of a, a vertex, you do that. So you always want to have this reverse direction, getting rid of vertices. So 
since if you end up with the boundary of a simplex, then you know that your original space was a triangulation of the sphere. Done, right? So then you start with your big triangulation. Perhaps you have to add uh, some edges first, go, go up a little bit, then you go down a little bit, and the whole thing you run like a simulated annealing process. Here's a well, symmetric example. That's a nine vertex triangulation of the torus. You flip two edges, you flip two further edges, uh, you flip two more edges, and then here you're in a situation to remove these two vertices, and you end up with a uh, minimal triangulation of the torus. So it's even possible to recognize more manifolds, not only the three sphere. Well, for some very basic examples, it's enough um, to, to know some minimal triangulation. If you know some minimal triangulation, where you indeed have the topological type, you start out with your reference object. Uh, no, you, you start with your test object. Uh, if you have a triangulation of RP3, and then you decrease the size, and if you get something that is combinatorial, isomorphic to your reference object, you're done. For more complicated uh, ciphered three manifolds or other three manifolds, you can still start with a re reduction, and then in a second step, use a three manifold recognizer of Matveyev. This is correct. This is a theorem by Pachner. Uh, it says that whenever two triangulations of a manifold, whatever the dimension is, if they are PL homeomorphic, then they are connected by a sequence of bistellar flips. But finding it on the computer might be very hard. The right. In particular, you might add many, many, many vertices. So therefore, uh, the recognition is not guaranteed. And, uh, but so they are connected. It, well, surprisingly, it works. Well, you could do so, but then you would need a reference object. Uh, so you can decrease the size. And well, then you might uh, start analyzing the sphere. Uh, you look at the vertex links. Um, and perhaps you find that some of the vertex links is a homology sphere, um, and then you might guess what the thing is. Or you start out with a homology three sphere, you suspend it twice, you get uh, such a non-PL5 sphere, and if you hit this, uh, then you know that you were in this class of triangulation. Um, very good question, no. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. So um, the I show you more data. The experience says it works. It even works for huge spaces. Um, but there are also some obstructions. So here are some, some non-trivial triangulations of three manifolds. And they came out of some combinatorial cons construction. Uh, s some graph coloring stuff. So we didn't know the topological type a priori. And uh, the triangulations had, well, 2,500, 3,000 something vertices, and this is the number of facets. And it was possible to recognize those. So first of all, we used the bistellar flips to reduce the size, and then we could figure out the topolo uh, topological type. So this works if the Matveyev com um, complexity is not too complicated. So I wouldn't promise you that you can recognize every three manifold this way. What is, what is the number 13 on the left? Here? Well, this is a connected sum of uh, 13 tori, so that's a surface of genus uh, 13 times S1. So this really is a non trivial uh, three manifold. Okay? okay? Oh, ah, this is Seifert's notation of uh, Seifert manifolds. Um, so this, this means um, the resulting three manifold is orientable and the base space is orientable. And um, so this uh, means uh, you have um, one exceptional fiber. This is the base fiber, uh, how you can glue the thing together. 
So this is a description of a ciphered manifold. You can even do four manifolds. So, well, if, if you give me a, a four-dimensional simplicial complex, of course, the first thing that you want to know is, is it a manifold? And therefore, you have to check the vertex links. And this is, can be done with this bistellar flip program. Then once you're convinced that uh, the animal is a, a, a four-manifold, then you can compute the fundamental group. Next thing. Um, well, fundamental group, um, everyone knows that computing the fundamental group uh, is hopeless for four manifolds uh, because of the word problem. But if you happen to meet um, a simply connected four manifold, this step most of the time works in an instant. So you set up, you set up the relations and the relators, plug it into this group, algebra package gap, and uh, you get a result immediately. Well, provided that your space that you give to me uh, is simply connected. Surprisingly, it works. So maybe because of the word problem, if, you, if your triangulation is constructed in a way that uh, you get trouble with uh, the Todd Coxeter algorithm or so, uh, well, perhaps you can use bicellar flips to be perturb it a bit, and then again it will work out. So in the third step, you only need to compute cohomology intersection form signature. There's a program Polymake that does it for you. And then you use the classification of simply connected four manifolds and you're done. So. Um, this is true. Uh, you, well, you can, this way you cannot recognize it up to PL type. Um, if you're lucky enough, if you have a reference object that you have constructed before, and then if you compare it after a sequence of bistellar flips, then you also know the uh, PL type. In general, uh, just recently, people in, on four manifolds, they found a lot of um, exotic four manifolds. For example, S2 times S2 can be equipped with a um, non-standard PL st structure, with, which is equivalent to a, a non-standard smooth st structure. And uh, well, you could therefore uh, de detect the topological type, but not the PL type by computing the invariance. And uh, those people are still trying hard, uh, perhaps to even find uh, um, an exotic full sphere, but they haven't found yet one. Right, uh, you could recognize higher dimensional PL spheres with um, the Bistellar flip program, um, but, but, well, there's a three manifold that admits no flips. Well, of course, you can always add a vertex. This is always possible. You can subdivide a facet, but if you don't allow this move, uh, then there's an isolated uh, triangulation that, uh, well, it's rigid. You cannot do any flips. So therefore, it's really unknown what the space of triangulation is, what the path is. So from this example, you first have to add a vertex, and then maybe you get down. And there is a bunch of strange um, three spheres that we have constructed, non-shallable ones, non-constructable ones. Um, there are balls that are uh, non-collapsible. Uh, the way you get those is you have a, a trefoil knot or a double or triple trefoil knot that you place into a, a triangulation of the three ball and then um, you force such a ball to be uh, non-constructible and non-collapsible. If you close the ball to a sphere, it remains non-shallable. Then, for example, shelling is another uh, heuristic that allows you to, well, if you can shell a sphere, then it's a sphere. Um, but if you get stuck, you don't know anything. So, but it's easy to, to get examples that seem to be difficult, but with respect to bistellar flips, they behave nicely. And then, of course, there are two fundamental results that, in general, you cannot recognize a four-manifold, and you not even can recognize a d-sphere if uh, d is larger or equal to four. It's an open problem yet whether you can recognize four spheres. That's unsettled. And there are non-PL spheres, and there are non-PL spheres with few vertices. So in theory, this spoils the game, what we have here. But, so why don't we run into these examples? Well, there are three easy answers. Where do we get the examples from? 
where, where do we get the data from? By enumeration. Uh, well, unfortunately, we don't get far with, uh, with enumerating examples. So bad examples need more space than we can enumerate. Uh, well, we can start with a combinatorial construction, and those constructions are mostly harmless. <laughs> or, well, of course, you can start with a topological construction, like uh, gluing things together, joints, or whatever. But then, well, you know a priori that uh, what the outcome is. Uh, well, of course, you can do a, some complicated construction, give it to me, then uh, I'm, well, I'm lost. But um, in theory, we know the, uh, the outcome. Your, your, your number two combinatorial question was the harmless. Is that theorem or guess? <laughs> um, that's a guess. Here's an example for it. That's a home complex construction that comes from graph theory. Uh, take it as a black box. So there's some combinatorial construction. And um, well, first of all, this yields a cell complex. And then you can triangulate the cell complex. And what you get is uh, almost uh, 2,000 vertices, 50,000 uh, uh, four-dimensional simplices. And then it takes, well, forgotten, maybe an hour or so. And you reduce this triangulation to a size that, uh, where you can then run um, uh, programs like computing homology. So computing homology on this animal is hopeless. So first of all, if you want to compute these invariants, do, do that on a small triangulation that you have achieved by, by stellar flips. And he, here is even a, a larger one. This is a five-dimensional thing. And with, well, more than half a million phases, and I think this took half a week to reduce it to a 12-vertex triangulation. And then you can read off the topological type, which, which is non-trivial. So here is a connected sum of 12, uh, 29 uh, copies of S2 times S2. And here, um, well, we get S2 uh, times S3, which is a Stiefel manifold. So in practice, it works. Um, sometimes you stop when it looks good enough, uh, but there are lower bounds also that I'm not okay, showing today. Yeah. But close to that bounds, I, I, at least I want to say something about the combinatorics of three manifolds. Here's an exercise for you. Which of the following are f vectors of three manifolds? So f vector that was the number of vertices, number of edges, number of triangles, numbers of tetrahedra. Can you guess? <laughs> well, the with oh, yeah, well, we can get rid of the negative yeah. numbers. So, the zero, uh, oh, the zero looks bad. Yeah. Yeah, we don't want to have that. Uh, this one looks good. Why? So we get an example that gives us this vector. The one, one vertex is suspicious. Ah, this one is a good one. It looks suspicious, yeah. <laughs> well, this, but this one depends on your taste. <laughs> <laughs> you know why I'm saying this? No. Well, if you, well. Most of the time we were uh, looking at simplicial complexes, but hmm? no. Well, this is a manifold with one vertex. Um, this is what those people do uh, if they study three manifold triangulations with one vertex. Uh, these are pseudo simplicial triangulations. Um, there you allow that you uh, have identifications on a boundary. Say it's enough. One, one uh, tetrahedron is enough to triangulate. Uh, the three sphere or RP3. Um, well, for tetrahedron, if you uh, glue together two adjacent triangles and the other two, then well, the first thing is still a ball and the th second uh, yields the three sphere. Um, so this one is good as a pseudo simplicial triangulation, but it's of course not good as a simplicial complex. So, uh, well, this has a special role, of course. Uh, so here's the outcome. Well, this is special. That's a matter of taste, what kind of triangulations you like. The green ones are good. Um, the red ones aren't. And um, of course, 
these ones are bad. Uh, and uh, the violated condition is, well, these are not effectors of a simplicial complex. And effectors of a simplicial complex, you can, uh, well, look up what the cross curl Katona theorem says, and then you can check this. But then uh, you were right, this one looked good. Uh, this one is good also. This is the vertex minimal triangulation of RP3. Here's some construction. Again, you can take it as a dodecahedron with identifications. So these two vectors are nice. This one is the pseudo simplicial one. This one is nice. Um, that's a triangulation of the Weeks manifold, which is the uh, hyperbolic manifold of smallest volume. These two vectors are not good. Here, uh, we don't have that the other characteristic is zero. Here, double counting doesn't work. So, but these two uh, equations yield that the effector of a three manifold should have this form. We can check, of course. This one is not good. Well, we have too many edges. So we, uh, at most, we should have um, F, F zero choose two. And this one is not good because um, we violate, violated the lower bound. So we can get rid of those. But of course, you want to know more than this. And here's a theorem of walk-up. And this is where this three manifold invariant gamma comes in. So for every three manifold, there is a largest possible integer such that for all triangulations, um, you have that F1 is larger or equal to four times S0 plus this invariant. And there is the smallest possible integer um, such that um, whenever you have such a pair, there is a triangulation. So this second part says something about the existence of triangulations. And if we plug this, uh, these two inequalities into a, a diagram, then what you can see here, this um, parable is, um, of course, uh, F0 choose one. You cannot have more edges. So this is the number of vertices. This is the number of edges. Um, then there is uh, this uh, um, linear thing here, um, which says that you must have at, at least uh, so many edges. And uh, then, for example, for the triangulation of the three sphere, all these dots are possible. If you're looking at a different manifold, then you might have to slide this line. And the statement uh, of Walkup roughly says that um, in general, there are two lines uh, corresponding to gamma and gamma star. One line says that, well, for this particular manifold, all triangulations are lying above this line. And the second uh, line says, well, whenever you're looking at such a point for this manifold, then there is such a triangulation of the manifold. For, for, for this thing in between, there might or might not be triangulation. So it could be that you have a triangulation here, but not, not here or so. OK. So what Walkup did is he computed this invariant for the three sphere, for the uh, twisted product, for the product, and for RP3. And he was able to show that Otherwise, the invariant is larger or equal to eight for other examples. Well, what we did, oh, yeah, what we did is we renormalized the whole thing um, by adding 10. <laughs> well, that was useful. And um, <laughs> I, I, I tell you why. So one, one reason is, Instead of gamma, a small little gamma uh, is equal to minus 10 for the three sphere. Now you have um, capital gamma is equal to zero, which is nicer. And um, otherwise, this, this is the, the statement of walk-up reformulated in terms of this gamma invariant. I tell you in a little uh, uh, few seconds or moments uh, why this really is an invariant. Um, prove the statement of walk-up and also to get an improvement. Here's a little sketch of what is going on. So here you start with the f-vector. And with the f-vector, I do a linear transformation. Um, well, I do it somehow. 
And this yields the h vector. And another linear uh, transformation lead, leads to the g vector. Well, the g vector is very, very useful. Um, for example, if you do this bistellar flip game, then uh, if you do a bistellar flip, all the g entries stay the same, except that one entry of the g vector is either increased or decreased by one. So g vector is a useful thing. And we will use it here also. So these are the first two relations that we get for three manifolds, or for general manifolds and for dimension three. We have this G2, and here the number 10 appears. So the number 10 has to be, uh, ha has something to do with this set off for the G2. So now we can understand why this is a um, topological invariant. So we say that a triangulation K of a three manifold M, um, well, this K is G2 minimal if G2 of this triangulation is smaller or equal to G2 of all other triangulations, then it's G2 minimal. And, and this way, we could define gamma of M as a topological invariant in terms of this G vector entry. Well, in addition, we say K is G2 irreducible if it's G2 minimal, and these are two additional assumptions. It should not be the boundary of a simplex, and it should not have empty um, facets. This we do want to rule out. And, but, well, why are G2 irreducible uh, triangulations are interesting? Well, they give strong restrictions on the vertex links. So just by looking at these um, properties, we get strong restrictions. And those we can use in an enumeration. And in particular, uh, Walkup showed that for every G2 irreducible triangulation, we get an additional inequality. And well, what we were able to was to improve this inequality a little bit. But this little bit is nice. So if we are going to uh, enumerate G2 irreducible triangulations, then they should not have more than F0 to 2 vertices. We have this inequality in addition. And well, here comes some constant gamma in it, uh, in the game. So if you, if you give me some gamma, then I can say, OK, now let's look at all irreducible G2 irreducible triangulations that have at most F1 smaller or equal to this expression many um, edges. And this gives us such a gray triangle. Well, this is not a, a proper edge, but um, at least that's a, a nice triangle. And if you are searching uh, for G2 irreducible triangulations that have, say, gamma small or equal to 15 or 16, then they must lie in, in such a triangle here. And now we only have to check for G2 irreducible triangulations for, for all these dots here in this triangle. And this is how far we got. For this point, we needed 1,000 CPU days. And, uh, but we could settle it. And this led to this expression that gamma of M is larger or equal to 21 for all other three manifolds, except for those examples that we found. So here we have gamma of M is larger or equal to 21. And well, in between, besides the four examples of Walkup, we were able to uh, determine the values of gamma for some more uh, connect, uh, connected sums of sphere bundles. So here's some more stuff on this gamma invariant. So the, the Matveev complexity um, of a three, three manifold, there are different ways to define it via spines or so. Or you can also define it via the minimal number of tetrahedra of a pseudo simplicial triangulation. So again, this was a matter of taste. Um, there are a few exceptions. So for example, um, the complexity of the three sphere is zero 
although you need at least one tetrahedron. But there are, say, four three-manifolds uh, which are exceptional. And otherwise, it's really the minimal number of tetrahedra. And this Matveev complexity has two nice properties. So finiteness. First of all, C of m is a non-negative integer, such for a fixed m that you give to me. Um, there's only um, a finite number of irreducible three-manifolds um, such that ma the Matveev complexity is small or equal to m. So therefore, if you look at three-manifolds, you have layers. So uh, complexity is small or equal to 12, small or equal to 13, and then you really can write finite tables up to this complexity. So what has this to do with uh, our gamma? Well, gamma of m, again, is a non-negative integer such that for fixed m, um, we only have a finite number of irreducible three-manifolds um, with this property. And we get something like subadditivity. So if we compute gamma on a connected sum, we know that it's at least small or equal to uh, uh, the gamma entries of the individual three-manifolds. And well, the question is, is this uh, gamma invariant indeed a complexity measure of three manifolds? I managed to finish in time. <laughs> Thanks. What does this question mean? Um, oh, whether we have equality here. Oh, I see. So we have subadditivity, uh, but uh, this is what we want to have. Well, this one? Yes. Well, um, for all the examples that we found, it, it was correct. So, uh, well, I, have, I haven't this here in my talk, but uh, we computed tables um, for, for this gamma invariant. And the nice thing is more or less the tables, they correspond to, uh, to the tables uh, those people have uh, with respect to the complex uh, Matveev complexity. So, well, the three sphere in both uh, words show, show up, uh, shows up first, then like the lens spaces, L31 or RP2. And so this is quite comparable. And the nice thing is, uh, Ed Schwartz recently had a look at this again, and uh, he figured out that some of the statements uh, uh, on the Matveev complexity can be reformulated in terms of this gamma invariant. Uh, because they are related uh, to each other by, by subdividing triangulation. So um, this really gives a statement. But uh, so the difference here is that this one lives in the world of pseudo simplicial triangulations, and this lives in the world of uh, triangulations as simplicial complexes. And uh, of course, both worlds are interesting for their own right. Uh, in this sense, we are interested in knowing more on this gamma invariant. Well, thanks a lot. <laughs>